Thank you, Alden, for the kind introduction, and um, good morning, afternoon, evening to um, all the all the people online today. It's so exciting to talk to such um, a large but also impressive and interdisciplinary audience here. Um, so thank you very much to the organisers for the invitation. Um, so if you were online for the previous session, this is um, the previous presentation by Ted, which was super fascinating, and this will be a complete uh, change of gears uh, now from, from the very technological um, to, to the policy. And so, uh, as Alden mentioned, I uh, can I just check that you can hear me okay? Uh, thumbs up? Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have been working with international organisations as well as, as government and industry. As, as largely as part of the Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific Grand Challenge at the Australian National University. And that's really what's brought me to this topic today is uh, through working particularly with governments, uh, seeing something which looks to someone um, even like me who's been working in the field of sort of trade and the environment for about 20 years uh, to be something quite new uh, in terms of global regulation and governance in the um, economic and environmental space. Uh, and that is what I'm calling, um, so I'm just trying to get us to, there we go, uh, international green economy collaborations. Uh, so the motivation really uh, is, you know, to identify, describe and motivate this, this new feature of our regulatory landscape. And I think it's really important to understand it and to be able to share learnings rapidly because this is um, a regulatory feature that is really aimed at exactly the aims of, of the MIT A plus B conference. And that is to get new technologies researched, developed, scaled and adopted around the world um, as fast as possible. And we know that if we want scale, we need to do things not only uh, within our own nation states, we need to collaborate across borders, ideally globally, but at least um, sort of more than one country at a time. And so that's why I think this, this presentation really uh, does fit into the theme of today's conference. So the outline for today, I'm firstly going to explain what I think this new phenomenon is um, with this little acronym of, of IGEX, uh, International Green Economy Collaborations. And then I'm going to try and relate them to sort of some existing things that, that people already have thought about and written about. And one is um, to think of them as potentially a form of environment focused deep trade agreement. Another way to think of them is as um, international version of green industrial policy. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the drivers and purpose um, of IGEX, um, including the green growth imperatives and you know, environmental imperatives, as well as you know, a, a potentially uh, arguably less, less noble um, imperative, and that is geoeconomic and geostrategic. Uh, and then I'll conclude. Yeah, so, so what are these international green economy collaborations? Uh, we define them um, as international collaborations aimed at achieving mutual economic and environmental benefits through inducing structural change in shared value chains. Uh, so there are lots of examples springing up almost by the day there. It's hard to keep track of them. Um, here in Australia, a key one at the moment that has been negotiated is the Australia-Singapore Green Econ Economy Agreement. Um, there is, of course, the proposed US-EU uh, carbon-based sectoral agreement on steel and aluminium trade. Um, the EU, indeed, um, is quite into uh, this form of governance, so they also have the um, a green alliance with Japan. Um, and, of course, Germany um, has an initiative for an international carbon club with the G7. And that's just a few of the examples. There are many, many of these. The Australian government, for example, uh, has, I think, I think nine or maybe 12 and counting um, such partnerships being led either by the Department of Industry or um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade currently. Um, so what, what are these, these collaborations actually comprise? And, you know, they take a whole range of forms. Some of them uh, are just currently nothing more than a joint statement. 
Others are as, as advanced as a memorandum of understanding. Uh, none have really got to the stage um, of being completed yet, but some of them, like the Australia-Singapore Green Economy Agreement, will be you know, full-on international agreements or treaties um, between countries. Um, so what is in these things? Once again, uh, obviously these these collaborations all vary in their in their focus and their scope but some of the things that we're starting to see in them is things like alignment of definitions of what are green goods or what is the green industry um, where what should we call um, green finance you know where should we direct green finance or what our statistical agencies both consider um, is a green industry another very important one um, that's going to take a lot of time and effort um, but is going to be really important is the alignment of methodologies for accounting for embedded emissions. So if you think about um, the great deal of excellent work that's gone in over decades into carbon accounting, that's mostly been following the IPCC guidelines and it's been about national accounts. So really you sort of you have your methodologies that might go all the way down to a facility level but they're all about accounting for the total emissions in some jurisdiction, be it a state or, or a nation that can then be reported. Um, what we need here to support international trade is actually to account for the embedded emissions in a product that may well move through value trains across borders. Um, and so it's a, it's a different unit of analysis. It's very important, um, especially if we start having things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms or certification of clean and green goods, um, that we're sort of counting apples as apples in terms of the embedded emissions accounting. It's also important that these different accounting methodologies don't become non-tariff barriers to trade. So, so we're seeing a lot of um, collaboration over um, unification or at least interoperability of things like methodologies for carbon accounting and certification schemes. There's also um, things like mutual commitments to support the emergence of cross-border value chains in new and emerging green industries and technologies. And that's particularly evident in the hydrogen economy. So, so countries like Australia, which are hoping to be big exporters of hydrogen, so at, at the very upstream end of the value chain, working with countries like Germany and Japan and South Korea, um, who are hoping to be um, important players in the very downstream um, end of the hydrogen value chain. Uh, in addition to sort of formal commitments of money and, and collaboration, there's also an important signaling component um, to help sort of overcome um, what we might call chicken and egg problems. And so these are signaling to industry both in, 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 in both partner countries or, or maybe in a plurilateral setting as well about where government is, is likely to be seeing these technologies going and which are going to be the key technologies. Uh, important for, for the very sort of early stage technologies, um, there are commitments for joint research and development and joint pilot programs um, and there are investment and trade facilitation efforts including you know, really sort of trying to pair up um, investors and trading partners um, from, the, from the various countries involved in the agreement. So how then, um, how then do we think about these things? Do we know sort of a list of things that are in them, but you know, how should we think about them? Um, one very real possibility is to think of them really as just environmentally focused deep trade agreements. So we know that, you know, trade agreements have been getting ever more complex um, over time. So if you think about something like the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, it was you know, very much focused on um, relatively simple, very much at the border things like let's lower our, our tariffs on imports. Um, over time, of course, trade agreements have become much more complex. And so the most up-to-date Sort of understanding that we have of what the trade agreements are is thanks to Matthew et al. Um, and, and this is their diagram that I've reproduced here for you. And so they think of three broad objectives of these deep trade agreements. The central and sort of, you know, 
oldest one, if you want, is the aim of establishing economic integration rights. And so, you know, good old tariff liberalisation is, is core to that, of course. Um, there are also increasingly things aimed at what we call behind the border measures. And those are things that um, are aimed at protecting those economic integration rights and importantly, limiting government discretion to undo them. So you may um, have agreed to liberalise your tariffs uh, on, on sugar, for example, but then you bring in some biosecurity thing that, that means every bag of sugar that comes to your country needs to be checked. Uh, and that raises the cost even more than the old tariff used to do. And that's the sort of thing um, that, that these deeper trade agreements also try and avoid. So a lot of sort of trade facilitation, regulatory collaboration aspects. Um, the third thing that they tend to do is to try and expand consumer rights and social welfare. And so that's actually placing obligations on exporters. And this is where you will see often in deep trade agreements, both labor or, and environment chapters in those agreements. Um, so obviously a lot of overlap um, with what I've been describing here so far. Um, so commonalities, things like the trade facilitation, as we mentioned, talking about, well, let, let's, um, let's agree what green goods are, and then maybe we can preferentially liberalize those green goods. Um, regulatory collaboration to minimise um, non-tariff barriers to trade, like the alignment of the definitions and their common approaches to embedded emissions accounting. And obviously the consumer rights and social welfare, bit, particularly the environment chapters, is, is all things that we could say, okay, maybe, maybe these um, international collaborations are nothing other than, other than deep trade agreements. Um, however, I think there are some important differences in these collaborations um, versus what we've seen traditionally in the trade agreements. Um, and I want to say that these IGECs are, are more positive and constructive um, as opposed to sort of limiting of government and exporter um, discretion, which tended to be the deep trade agreement approach. So deep trade agreement environment chapters tend to focus on preventing leakage or race to the bottom um, whereas the IGEX focus on, on opportunities for environmental collaboration. So really sort of looking at the, at the plus side, um, what can we do new and good for the environment as opposed to how do we stop countries trying to lower their environmental standards in order to get a competitive advantage? Uh, uh, yeah. The, the other, I think, really important um, distinction is the ICEX um, focus on really on the actual cross-border value chain aspect uh, as opposed to limiting, um, the, which is the, what the dictate agreements do, trying to limit the behind the border domestic market protection. Um, so really, once again, looking at, at the positive side of things and how do we make the cross-border value chain work as opposed to um, a focus on making sure there's not some sort of hidden protectionism uh, being undertaken under the guise of uh, an environmental protection. So an alternative way of thinking about the IGEX is as an international form of green industrial policy. Now, green industrial policy itself is something um, that is really a relatively new phenomenon. So if you, if you sort of look on, on Google, you see green industrial policy emerge first, really, as a term around the time of the global financial crisis, uh, because green industrial policy has these sort of multiple drivers, one of which being um, if we want to spend money to stimulate the economy, let's do it in a, in a build back better sort of way. Um, and, and so one way of thinking of these is as the international extension of green industrial policy. So, so what is green industrial policy itself? Um, there's, there are actually a lot of different definitions of this already in, in the literature. Um, and they vary quite substantially. So some focus on innovation and on, on infant or sunrise industries and on spec sector specific policies. So they're what you might call um, narrower definitions. So, so Roderick's 2014 definitions, 
well, he didn't exactly include a definition, but he sort of implied definition was, you know, to increase the availability of green technologies and production techniques. So really focusing on that innovation or sunrise sector end of things. Um, Halligetta et al. Um, similarly, they mentioned specifically sector targeted policies in their definition. So, so we're not sort of thinking broad whole of economy um, in either of those definitions. There are other definitions though that do take a really broad, all encompassing, um, including policies for both sunset and sunrise industries and whole of economy things like carbon pricing. And so Altenberg and Asman and Harrison et al. are examples of those. And so, you know, I'll, I'll remain agnostic uh, about what, you know, the correct um, definition of green industrial policy is. I think it's just always important to be clear if you're talking about green industrial policy, what definition you're operating under. Um, and so, so could we think of this new phenomena is IGEX as simply international green industrial policy. And um, certainly I think we could find international analogues um, for the various uh, definitions, um, taking examples from, from the ones that I've shown on the previous slide, right? So, so in many places, you just sort of replace um, a particular industry or sector, which was the focus of the original definitions, and change that to become shared value chains, because that is really you know, the key distinction is this focus on, on shared or cross-border value chains. Um, and so in my view, I think, I think these do work in large part, except the narrower definitions, um, like that of Broderick and Halligate et al., I think would be a little bit limiting because as we've seen, there is quite a focus on, well, how do we, how do we get embedded emissions accounting and, and carbon pricing right? Um, and those are broader things that are probably beyond some of those narrower definitions. But if you're happy with a broad definition of what green industrial policy is, I think, you know, thinking of these IGEX as international green industrial policy is, is not an altogether, bad, altogether bad way to go. Um, and I think I think carrying on um, that analogy is really helpful when you're thinking about the drivers and purposes of um, these IGEX. So number one, the green growth imperatives. And I'm going to start with a very short slide. We we know there are environmental drivers for a whole lot of stuff going on, obviously. Um, very central to the IGEX. We have climate and biodiversity crises. We have thankfully increasing numbers of net zero commitments and environmental uh, agreements to try and address those crises. So this audience probably doesn't need any more detail on that one. Okay, so, so given um, you know, the environmental driver, what, what would then be the purpose of these things if we were thinking of them as environmental deep trade agreements? Um, the purpose in this case would be primarily reducing trade distortions arising from unilateral actions. As we said, the sort of deep trade agreement view is generally about stopping unilateral government actions from, from causing trade distortions. And there is certainly a lot to be, you know, said in that regard here. So alignment of embedded emissions accounting rules is really important because if everyone else has a different embedded emissions accounting rules, if I don't believe what you've told me about what the embedded emissions are in the hydrogen, the ammonia or the steel that you're sending me, and if I sort of make your, um, your producers not only you know, go to the cost and effort of doing your own accounting, but they also have to follow my accounting rules, then I can very quickly um, generate um, a non-tariff barrier to trade. And so sort of, you know, reducing those could definitely be understood um, as an environmental deep trade agreement approach to these. Um, they certainly provide not only sort of specific uh, rules in the initial MOU or the initial agreement, but a lot of what um, these IGEX do is also provide governance frameworks. And that's really important because, as we all know, the world is changing so rapidly, both on the technology and the policy front. And so what we are increasingly going to need is 
good frameworks for what we call responsive rev regulation so that as new issues emerge, um, we can have an appropriate regulatory response to those issues. And I think um, that is definitely one of the other things that these, um, these IGEX provide. Uh, the other sort of way of thinking about their purpose from a DTA point of view is in terms of the preferential treatment of green products. Um, making sure that certification systems which identify, if you want, clean hydrogen or green steel um, are, are interoperable, again, um, avoiding the sort of doubling the regulatory costs of having to meet multiple certification requirements aligning green product definition lists so that we can preferentially liberalise. So what would be the purpose then um, of these IGEX if we thought of them as international green industrial policy? Uh, the, the economists in the room will probably be very comfortable with thinking of these as a way of addressing cross-border market failures. So um, the traditional economic understanding of industrial policy in general is as a way of addressing um, the market failures that are making an industry less likely to grow than it optimally should. And so what we're looking at here is addressing the, the market failures which are stopping the development of, of cross-border supply chains. A key component of that, a key sort of market failure in this regard, um, is what we might call the chicken and egg problems. And that is, uh, once again, to use the hydrogen value chain. Uh, if, if Australian investors are having trouble, for example, securing finance um, to build generation capacity for green hydrogen, uh, because no one um, is sure that they're going to be able to find off takers. At the other end, the off takers are very reluctant to make the major investments in, in redesigning their chemical plants and their steel plants um, in order to rely on green hydrogen because they're not confident that they're going to be able to have a secure and, and appropriately priced supply of green hydrogen. Then, then we have you know, these sort of codependent investments along the supply chain. And this is where these uh, um, IGEX come in and the, and the government at both ends of those supply chains can say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to back my end of the industry if you back your end of your industry, um, then that can really help overcome those startup problems for these industries and for these cross-border supply chains. Um, so not only sort of do governments take money in the hand, but also, as I said, they, they, they signal very clearly um, that they will support their industries in whatever evolving way is needed. The other um, sort of major uh, market failure, aside, you know, aside from the, the biggest market failure of all, is, is of course the externality of, of greenhouse gas emissions and, and the climate impacts, um, is information asymmetry. And, and in particular, um, not, you know, that the buyer of a product um, can usually not see what the so-called non-product um, process and production methods are non-product embedded process and production methods and, and principally in the climate space what we're talking about is what are the embedded emissions um, in that product um, upstream in the supply chain and so once again solving solving a market failure so I think I think um, the green industrial policy um, framework works very well to describe the purpose um, of, of these IGEX. As I mentioned at the start though, uh, there is another very important um, driver of the IGEX and that is um, geoeconomics. So geoeconomics, once again, a relatively new uh, piece of jargon. You can pretty much substitute it for geostrategic or geopolitical objectives. Um, there is fierce technology competition, as I'm sure many of the people online today are aware. Um, and, and this is a driver of a lot of domestic green industrial policy initiatives. Countries know that, that, that there are um, dynamic economies of scale, that if you can give your um, sort of new technology industries that, that push, that head start, that they can very well likely stay ahead of the pack for um, many decades to come. And, and that is what we're seeing happening all around the world. We also know, however, that you know these scale economies 
um, they don't just sort of stop at the scale of, of a domestic market and in debt, particularly for smaller countries. Um, and that, you know, the bigger the better when it comes to scale economies. And we've seen the incredible impacts that that's had, for example, on the prices of solar panels and, and wind turbines. So, you know, those, those learning curves are really rather magnificent and, and, and uh, doing, you know, they're our best hope for the world of not having a four degree world. So um, there are advantages to to those who can get their industry to to have that push start and you need to collaborate with your strategic partners in order to get that scale um, in particular you want to do it ahead of your sort of strategic comp competitors and of course we know there's you know major geoeconomic um, competition between the us and china but there are other very important players like the eu like japan uh, and so um I don't think we should underestimate the, the motivation for of, of the geoeconomics as a driver for these um, collaborations. And one thing to be particularly aware of, as I'm sure many of you are, is the role of critical minerals. So we know that they're going to be very important in the energy and the net zero transition. Um, you know, the IEA estimates they'll be up to 50% of energy related trade by the 2050s. We also know that China currently has a lot of market power. And, and particularly in light of what we've seen um, be the fallout of the European dependence on, on Russia for fossil fuels, um, there is a lot of nervousness and therefore a lot of drive to try and get up alternative supply chains that do not rely on China uh, among the Western countries. All right, so um, I hope that was, you know, for some of you, um, potentially something very new, but hopefully not completely um, jargon barrier in incomprehensible. I uh, hope you can see that it's um, it's got an important role to play in, in getting these exciting technologies that many of the presenters are talking about today um, up and out into the world um, quickly. I think this is a policy phenomenon that is not going to go away anywhere soon. I think it's going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to evolve. Um, the drivers, you know, both environmental and geostrategic are, are only getting stronger. Uh, what the overall um, result of these agreements will be, I, I think remains to be seen, uh, certainly insofar as they facilitate um, keeping trade barriers low and, and collaboration. They're going to be very helpful. Uh, where, where it's not altogether clear how helpful they'll be to the world is the extent to which they facilitate this sort of bifurcation of the global economy um, between the major powers. And, and so um, that, that will be a space to watch. But certainly these are going to be an important um, and growing form of economic and environmental governance in the decades to come. So, Thank you all very much for your attention and I look forward to questions. Great, thank you, um, Anna, for that was really a fascinating view into the world of international uh, collaboration. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, many of us, including myself here, working more on, on technologies. Um, so uh, maybe one, one question to get started here and I'll, I'll encourage everyone to ask questions through the Q&A uh, window. But uh, I, I was curious, the, uh, you know, we work on, at this conference, we talk a lot about uh, adopting technologies, green energy technologies, developing new technologies. So could you say a little bit more about how does the, these international um, collaborations, agreements affect uh, you know, uh, the development of, of, of new technologies that we need for, for uh, decarbonisation and energy transition? Yeah, great, excellent question. And I think, I think at that end of the technology scale, the most important aspect of these is often that there is, there is literally sort of joint research money um, that the governments put towards um, specific target industries. So I know, for example, um, the Australian government has, has um, and the German government have both put money into joint initiatives, these sort of collaborations for research and development, both at the technology end, but also on, on the policy end. Um, so there's, there's um, you know, 
everything, high supply, high gate, you know, there's a lot of these initiatives and they do actually um, have in, in many cases a research pot associated with them. Research pots that are um, importantly usually very much linked to having, um, to being led by an industry partner because, you know, they want to see actual supply chains emerging as soon as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of the very cutting edge, uh, as, as many participants here know, um, research, even sort of lab scale, is happening with industry partners. Um, so I, I think... Um, I think these can be, you know, so make sure you're aware of whatever your government's up to if, if you're in this space, um, because there can be some really exciting funding and, you know, cross-border collaboration on research. Yeah, no, fully, fully agree. It's a great, great point. Um, at the same time, I know by experience, it's sometimes hard to establish research projects between countries um, and continents. So, um, but of course, we, we need this global solutions to address this, this huge uh, challenge ahead of us. Um, so um, maybe one more question on, on you mentioned, uh, you used the term geoeconomics, um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of turmoil in the energy markets these days at the global scale. Um, could you say a little bit more about how that impacts the uh, these uh, I I jacks, as you call them, the international green energy collaborations? You know, do, do you think it leads to more of these collaborations, or are governments becoming more, uh, you know, they care more about their own, uh, you know, perspective only in, in this type of situation? I, I think we're seeing a bit of both. Um, so yeah, we are seeing. Uh, some domestic focus green industrial policy. I'm actually sitting here in Germany right now, and you know the the, the government here, the new, the new government, has a lot of focus for understandable reasons on domestic energy production now. But at the same time, um, there is also a great interest in in figuring out, okay, who are my strategic partners, and how? Because you know we understand that um, the energy transition particularly for countries like Germany, will be impossibly expensive if they try and do it autarkically, completely on their own without trade in any form. So um, there is a lot of interest in finding your, you know, your safe partners and developing strong relationships with them. And, and this is not only in terms of direct energy trade like hydrogen, but as I mentioned, those, those critical minerals, um, you know, there's no point for, for a country like Germany to, to wean itself off, um, you know, a 50% dependence on Russian fossil fuel in exchange for a 90% dependence on Chinese, you know, controlled critical mineral value chains. And so, um, so Australia is, is, you know, because we have the resources um, working with a lot of partners on exactly the sort of ICEX for, um, for critical mineral development. Right. So, um, okay. So we have a question here um, from Stephen Bryant. Do you want to ask the question yourself? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. That was uh, uh, interesting. We, uh, it's kind of a two-part question. I'll, I'll throw them both at you and you can choose. Um, we're familiar with industrial policies. Every country has had those without the G for green you know, for ages. And so it'd be interesting to hear you talk about are those in conflicts or how do we morph from one to the other? There's there's a balance there. And you didn't talk about the industries themselves. And so CEOs are now looking at ESG targets uh, more than they ever used to. Um, but are how do we get them on board as well with whatever the diplomats are figuring out, right? So classic industrial policy and then uh, industry buy into these things and what is their influence on the policy that comes out? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Excellent questions. Yeah, so uh, any of us who are old enough know that um, not that long ago, industry policy was actually a really dirty word, particularly among economists. Um, and it was actually synonymous with protectionism, is why it was so unpopular. Um, so it was thought to be bad for trade and also. Um, you know, you would have the problem of government capture. And so 
those problems have not gone away, although we have, um, you know, some some excellent thinkers, including the likes of Danny Roderick, has sort of said, well, you know, there are ways we can avoid the government failure um, that sort of led to industry policy being out of fashion for so long. And there are many people um, in the energy transition, including economists, who, who realise you know, just simply, it's not all that simply, but even if we could politically just, you know, just price the emissions, that is not going to be enough to get us there fast enough anymore. There are all these other market values that are inhibiting um, the development of, you know, the structural transitions that we need. So I think there's um, a really broad acknowledgement that we do need to bring industry policy back, sort of grit our teeth um, and, and, and get over it, but try and learn from those lessons of the past past, and, and think about ways, you know, including um, sorts of constraints on government to try and reduce um, those problems of capture that, that had played it in the past. Uh, the question, yeah, so, so whether you think these things are that related to um, cleaning up industry more generally and getting them more broadly on board depends a little bit on what you think industrial policy is. So, so for those who say green industrial policy is really these sector targeted things, we're really talking about let's get a green hydrogen industry, let's get a green steel industry. Um, so not necessarily looking across the board um, at those STG things. Uh, but other people do have a, have a much broader view. And actually, I was at an S&P 500 Global Sustainability Summit the other week, and it was really fascinating because um, in, a, in a lot of sense, the private sector has actually been leading quite a lot of climate initiatives and the governments have been lagging. And it was really fascinating hearing them all really worried about the regulatory burden of having to figure how, out how to do all this on their own. And, and so I had originally um, been thinking, you know, before I heard them talking, oh, look, this, you know, I'm, this is going to be a little bit of a threat for you. Look out, the governments are coming and they're going to start regulating, they're going to start getting in this space. At the end of the day, I realised that that was a promise, not a threat that some, finally governments are starting to step up and are starting to provide some of these regulatory supports and architectures, things like embedded emissions accounting frameworks um, that industries had to bear the cost of figuring out on their own so long. Hey, thank you. Um, so we're almost running out of time, but I, I want to ask one, one more question. So I work on electricity primarily, uh, and this is uh, this your talk is about international um, international collaboration. But I wanted to ask you about the situation in Australia right now. We hear about a lot of things happening in the Australian electricity market. Um, do you want to? You know, could you say a few words about that as well here? Um, uh, sure. So. Uh, once again, it comes down to, I don't know how much economics training people have, but most people um, know that um, prices are often determined by the marginal costs. And so although we have huge amounts of, well, not huge amounts, but large and growing amounts of renewables, we have obviously a lot of our own coal and we have a lot of our own gas. Our gas, particularly both of them, are, are exported. So we face the global prices. Uh, and so what you're seeing is the, the marginal price for when, you know, at peak times need to turn on that gas generator um, is being driven by the world gas prices. And so electricity prices are going up throughout almost all of Australia. I happen to be lucky enough to live in the Australian Capital Territory that has had um, a net zero electricity commitment um, was by 2020, net zero electricity. And they did that um, through a lot of um, reverse auctions and auctions um, for difference. And so because of that, actually electricity prices in the Australian Capital Territory are falling because the high high prices on the on the market means that we're actually getting money back um, from our contracted renewable energy suppliers. So that's a little bit of a positive story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much for a very fascinating uh, 